everybody. Welcome to another session of Earth Lessons Live. I am Imogen Cancellari, and this morning I'm going to be talking to you about two of my favorite things. I'm currently coming to you from Newark, Delaware, and I'm going to be talking about my research as a conservation biologist, which includes two awesome things. And we'll start with the first, which is snow leopards. So a little bit about who I am in the world. So I got my start several years ago where I majored in wildlife research. And the, re the research that I'm doing exclusively focuses on large carnivores. And I realized that I was interested in large carnivore work when I did an internship at a tiger sanctuary in North Carolina. And so this sanctuary was really awesome because it was a no touch facility that provided lifelong care to animals that had been rescued from private ownership. And the focus of this organization really, really uh, included a lot of education about wild populations and about tiger conservation and what we as individuals can do to help these animals. And so from this experience, I really became interested in how individuals can focus on wildlife conservation and how we can use research to better help wild populations. Now, I grew up on a farm, and so my experience prior to this was with livestock. And as someone who was interested in science, my question was always, well, if I want to be a scientist or if I want to work with animals, I should be a veterinarian, right? Well, the cool thing right now about social media and sessions like this is that we're able to talk to people all over the world who can show us that there are different ways to be involved in wildlife or animal research in several different capacities. And so the first thing that I did after I graduated with my bachelor's degree was do several different wildlife jobs. And so here is a photo of me working with an anesthetized bear in Missouri. So if you're not familiar, and anesthesia is just like the medicine that we get when we have surgery. And we were collaring bears to study their movements. I've also done research on other uh, on reptiles and amphibians. So here I was working with uh, baby American alligators. But my main interest has always been in carnivores. And if you're already noticing a theme, you would be correct. That theme happens to be wild cats. And the work that I have been doing for the last several years is focusing on different lab and field methods to address questions about these wild animals in particular. So this is a photograph of the very first job that I had after my bachelor's degree. And this, we were looking at bobcat movement and diet and genetic structure in Northwest Montana up near Glacier National Park, which is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And doing this project led me to my interest in bobcats, but more specifically, it helped me develop my interest in molecular ecology. And now molecular ecology is basically where we are able to take answer questions about an animal's ecology using laboratory methods, specifically with genetics. And so for my master's research, I was interested in understanding how bobcat populations in Texas are structured on a landscape. And more specifically, how, how environmental variables or abiotic and biotic factors, so things like rivers or mountains or cities or agriculture might structure bobcat populations and how those different variables influence their gene flow. And so the way that I did this was by combining field work to go out and actually collect tissue from live captured bobcats, as well as bobcats that were uh, killed on the road or died of natural causes that humans turned into me. But then I also took all of this information into the lab. And so this research is something that I'm really proud of because it was one of our first examinations of bobcat genetic structure in, Tex in the northern part of Texas. And uh, this is what led me ultimately to the research that I'm currently doing today. And so the thing that I'm really passionate about, like I said, I'm passionate about wild cats, but I'm also really passionate about genetics. And there are so many different things that genetic data can tell us about wild populations, whether it's evolutionary history, population structure, individual identification, or identifying problems like disease ecology or diet analyses, all of this different information can be used for conservation decisions and specifically conservation action. When it comes to threatened species or endangered species, there are a myriad of different threats that wild populations face. And the reality is that it's sometimes very difficult for us to be able to collect enough data in order to make reasonable inferences about a given population or in order to inform conservation decisions. And that's where enters the type of work that I currently do, which is, like I said, combining lab, uh, field work with lab work. Can I do that? with poop. 
So the type of uh, science that I, I, I work in, I like to call it poop science. And the reason that I call it that is because literally we are taking, we're drawing data out of fecal material that animals leave on the landscape. And the current project that I'm working on and the project that I've worked on for the last several years is on snow leopards. So this is a snow leopard. The snow leopard ranges in 12 different countries in Central Asia. And this is a map of Central Asia where we can see Mongolia over here. We can see China right here, and then there's India here, and then there's some of the uh, stands, so Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. And, and this, this blue section right here, all of this polygon, this is considered snow leopard range. And the snow leopard is a habitat specialist that lives at really high elevation above tree line in dry, rugged environments. This habitat is very remote and very difficult to access. So this right here is in China. This is in Kyrgyzstan where I was last year. These were taken a month apart. And so what we know about snow leopards in comparison to several other species is vastly different. We have huge gaps in our knowledge about the ecology, the natural history, and the evolution of these beautiful animals. And so my job is to try to fill in some of these knowledge gaps using a combination of field work and lab work. But because it's so difficult to access snow leopards, I obviously just can't go out into the field and collect data from an individual snow leopard. And it's a lot more difficult to collect information on these cats than it is on something like the bobcat, which is what I focus on for my master's. And so the way that we're able to get around this is using a, a combination of several different methods. Now, this is a, a video from one of my lab colleagues where they were studying, they were using camera traps in Tajikistan to study these animals. But I'm not using camera traps. I'm exclusively focusing on a different technique. And like I already said, that's poop. And so uh, since I can't take you out into the field, here's a photograph of snow leopard poop. This is what it looks like. And this is what I'm looking for all the time when I'm in the field. Even though it's really difficult to access or to find snow leopards, it's more easy to find this material if you know a little bit about where to look. And so the research that I do relies really heavily on collaborative efforts. And so I'm really lucky that I get to work with local researchers and local herders that live alongside these animals in, in Central Asia. And they are able to tell us where snow leopard prey is or where snow leopard sightings are. And even though these cats are really rare and elusive, they communicate with one another because of their complex social systems. And that involves leaving scat on the landscape to mark their territories. And so we know based on how snow leopards interact with one another and how they move about their territories, that they, they can leave their feces in really predictable areas. So by working with the local communities, we're able to go up into the mountains and look in areas to find material like this. And so once I find scat, I'm able to actually take a subsample of it and I take it back into the lab. And the reason that this works is because when you when an animal defecates, when the poop moves through their intestines, just like us, when the, when the poop moves through the intestines, they shed epithelial cells or, or cells containing DNA from the intestines. And this is on the outside of the scat material. And so when I get into the lab, I take the feces from the field into the lab. I use gloves, obviously. And I'm, I take a scalpel and I scrape off the outer edge of that feces. And so if we're going to pretend that my remote here is fecal material, I literally take a sample and I shave off the outer edge of it because I'm interested in the epithelial cells. And those cells contain the DNA of the individual that left the material on the landscape. And so then once I'm in, the next step for this is to actually extract that DNA. So DNA can be extracted through a series of uh, cleaning, pro cleaning processes that starts with lysing the cells. So all of, the cell, all of our cells have DNA in them. They have nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA. And if you picture the cell like a circle like this, the outer membrane has to be opened up in order to remove the DNA. So we use chemical, chemical or mechanical uh, methods to lyse or open those cells up. And then the DNA is floating around in our solution. And we can use a series of washes to both precipitate or pull out the DNA from our liquids and then clean it up. So then at the end of the extraction process, we have just a simple test tube of pure, clean DNA. <clears throat> so basically, we've gone from the field to the lab with a potentially stinky, kind of gross sample. And then at the end, we get just a clear, simple test tube that's about that big of DNA. And this is going to be the raw data that I use to ask some of my questions. But in order to figure out what it is, we have to identify it to species. Just because I think it looks like snow leopard poop doesn't mean that it is. And so we use species-specific genetic markers that can identify 
the species that left the fecal sample based on the DNA from the epithelial cells inside the body. And so once we're able to genetically identify it as snow leopard, then we can start answering questions about populations. And we do that by doing individual identification. So we use a series of different markers or like, kind of like genetic puzzle pieces to piece together information about an individual. So the puzzle pieces of my DNA are gonna be totally different from the puzzle pieces of your DNA and the same for all individual snow leopards. And so once we have individuals, we can then begin to answer questions like how many snow leopards are on this landscape? How are they genetically related to one another? Why does it matter? And what are some other questions that we might have based on the information that we are observing? And so let's see the next thing. Hold on, hold on. I'm seeing some questions. Uh, never knew that poo was so fascinating. Yes, our, do our dog loves finding and eating cat poo. You know what? That is a problem that I also have. And another thing that I will say is that when I was preparing, I used this photo for another presentation uh, when I was in Uzbekistan last year, but I didn't have any fecal samples. And so I literally went out into my backyard and collected some dog poo. So this is dog poo. It doesn't normally look like this. Uh, snow leopard poo looks more like this, something that you would find in a litter box if you own a domestic cat. It's really char it's really characteristic. Uh, fecal material for cats, like all cats in general, is really lobed, so it's really rounded, and it's often very segmented, like this. In contrast, canid or dog poo for diff of different species is not going to be quite as like segmented or like lobulated like this, and the ends are going to be really pinched off and kind of twisty like soft serve ice cream. I use a lot of food metaphors, so I'm really sorry if uh, that doesn't sound cool to other people. <laughs> um, and so this is, uh, this is a great time to answer another question. Someone asked, how many snow leopards have I seen? And so one of the jokes that we have a lot about people who work in the lab is that they don't often get out, or they're not able to get out into the field to explore. And I didn't really want, I, I didn't really explicitly want that. I have a lot of skills as a field biologist and I have skills as a lab biologist. So I really wanted to build a career that has, enables me to combine both. And so while I'm not able to do quite as much field work as I used to, because now I'm done with the field collection portion of my PhD, uh, I have been fortunate to see some snow leopards. And I'll play, play that again. I've seen four snow leopards in the wild. I saw them all in China and I saw all of them in about three weeks which is really uncharacteristic for snow leopard sightings, given that they are so incredibly rare and elusive. And this is a video taken by my colleague, Terry Townsend, um, of the Shan Shui Conservation Center in China. We were in a place in the world called the Valley of the Cats, which is one of the most pristine and beautiful places that I've ever seen. And on this particular day, this is the very first snow leopard that I ever saw. This is a female, and it was in July, and you can see that it was snowing. And so we were looking for snow leopards one day. I'm just going to keep replaying it because it's awesome. Um, on this particular day, we were looking for snow leopards, and uh, my colleague Terry saw her, and she crested over the ridge of a mountain and came charging down the mountain through the snow, straight out of like a Nat Geo or Discovery uh, video, and she was hunting uh, blue sheep. And unfortunately, she wasn't successful, but we were able to get this video of her really far up on the landscape. And she was uh, lactating. Uh, we, you can't, it's not easy to see here, but up here, like right around here when she's moving, you can see um, her, her, her memory glands and they're full. So we know that she had cubs. So she's hunting pretty much all day, every day to try to make sure she has enough resources for these, uh, for her cubs. And we saw her uh, twice. And then we saw uh, two other snow leopards. So it was three snow leopards over four sightings. And we saw this female hunting twice. And we saw a male snow leopard in the same area. And we saw a female not too far away. And so where I was is really exciting because snow leopards, like I said, are uh, really rare and elusive. And they have really wa uh, large home ranges and relatively low densities compared to something like deer uh, that you, or mice that you'd see in your backyard. They're just naturally carnivores have lower densities than um, like prey species would, most prey species. And so getting to see these cats, getting to see any snow leopard is really rare, but seeing so many in such a short period of time um, is even rare. And the reality is that in this part of China, this is one of the most pristine habitats. And due to uh, such significant coexistence with the local uh, Tibetan communities, these cats are not as afraid of people as we might expect carnivores in North America or in 
other parts of the world, um, it's not necessarily easy to see these guys. Um, and so seeing them was was certainly a real treat um, and something that I'm really uh, fortunate to have had the privilege to do. Uh, but the reality is I don't see them very often. Um, I mostly work with their fecal material. And so that's why we call this method non-invasive technology. Because the reality is, even though these animals are tolerant of us, and, or in this particular case, this cat was tolerant, Wild animals don't want to be our friend. They they don't make good pets. Uh, they're not interested in hanging out with us. Um, you know, we are potential predators to them. We could be threats. And so inter capturing them to interact with them unnecessarily is not something that we want to do. There are plenty of projects that require interacting with animals, and that's things like monitoring their health, doing uh, putting collars on them to monitor their movements for conservation action. But in my case, I'm able to do all of this work without ever having to see a snow leopard. And even though it's great to see one, the reality is that I do my research because I'm interested in conserving populations. And so the reason that I do this work is because I'm really interested in carnivores in general. Yes, I love cats. I think a lot of us like wild cats, but I am really interested in carnivores or terrestrial carnivores because of the their ecological role in any given ecosystem. Most carnivores are going to serve as an umbrella species, meaning that their persistence on the landscape enables the persistence of several different species. And so, for example, the snow leopard that has such a large home range, if we protect habitat, if we protect enough habitat and conserve landscapes so that populations of snow leopards are healthy, we're not only protecting snow leopards, but we're protecting so many other species. And the really exciting thing about snow leopards is snow leopards are inextricably linked to human health. And so where snow leopards live in Central Asia covers about uh, the water sources that provide uh, water for a third of the world's pop human population. And so protecting snow leopards protects resources that help us. But, in it, but whether it's something like a snow leopard or something smaller like a bobcat, their role in what we call trophic cascades, their role in the system of basically organizing the structure of different species is really important. Carnivores help structure the health of other uh, systems in, in a given ecosystem. So bobcats or wolves or mountain lions or bears help structure entire communities of wildlife species to help them stay healthy. And their persistence allows other populations to not only exist, but to also exist in reasonable healthy numbers. A great example of that is in Yellowstone in the United States, where the elimination of wolves resulted in a huge explosion of deer and elk population. And the deer and elk overgrazed a lot of portions in the park, in the valleys in the winter, and grew exponentially. But then there were too many animals on the landscape. They reached what's called carrying capacity, and they crashed. And so without the presence of wolves to help kind of maintain the stability of that the deer and elk population, they basically crashed. And so in the 90s, when uh, the government decided to reintroduce wolves to the landscape, we saw the landscape completely change. Deer and elk populations uh, reduced a little bit. They reduced below carrying capacity, and that allowed vegetation to grow, and that brought back several songbird species. And we saw beavers return to the river, which completely changed the structure of the landscape. And so this huge system is really important to have carnivores. Obviously, they're beautiful. They're fascinating. But their role in the ecosystem is what I'm really interested in. And so in the, oops, wrong screen. In the, the things that I'm interested but whether it's, you know, something big like a carnivore or your backyard, I'm really passionate about wildlife research and about wildlife conservation because there are so many opportunities for me or for you, anyone who's watching, regardless of where you are in the world, to help wildlife, whether it's setting up habitat in your backyard or, or helping species cross the road safely um, or finding new wildlife, going outside and viewing things. There's so many different ways that we can get involved in the conservation of wild populations. And someone just asked me, how do you find balancing skills in the field and lab and developing them? And the reality is by doing this as a hobby, we start to develop skills and, and begin asking questions that we might be interested in. And the reality is if you're interested in wildlife, it's not enough to just be really interested in the species. Yes, I think snow leopards are amazing and I am very fortunate to work with them, but the reality is I'm only able to work with these cats because of the specific skills and interests that I have and the need to answer certain questions. So because we don't know a lot about gene the genetic structure of snow leopards, we have projects that are working towards answering some of those questions. And I happen to be the current student 
in, the, in my particular position who has the skill set to do some of that work, to do that labor. And so if you're interested in wildlife, my recommendation is to not only focus on things that interest you, but to learn about other things that are related to that. So it's not just about knowing all of the facts about dolphins. It's not just about knowing everything there is to know about Luna moths. It's about understanding how those species are connected to and interact with other wildlife species and other parts of the landscape. And that can help us develop questions about addressing their conservation or learning more about them. And then we can able to then we can start to tailor our education to certain things, whether that's choosing a certain major in school or volunteering on a project or trying to develop the skill sets in the field and then in the lab. And then the last thing that I'll say to answer those questions um, about field work and lab work, fortunately, my daily or I, fortunately for me, my daily job is really different. And it's not just about being in the field or then being in the lab. Uh, both, or I don't do both in one day. So we generally have field seasons and then we have lab work. And I'm done with all of the field work. Um, and right now I'm like you, I'm stuck at home. So I'm not doing my lab work right now either. So I'm working on a lot of writing. And so the reality is we're able to space it all out in order to get it all done. And this is something that you can do as well, regardless of whether or not uh, you are already in school or you are thinking about choosing a major. I'm happy to answer so many more questions, both about snow leopards, about wildlife poo, and about genetic data. Um, and you can also find me online. You can um, talk to me about careers in wildlife or how to develop question, your own questions about a given wildlife species or how to develop skills in a specific discipline. Um, you can find me at my website, which is biologistimaging.com. You can also find me on Twitter, and my handle is at biologistimo. And you can find me on imaging or on Instagram with at biologistimaging. And I'd love to talk with you more about snow leopards. Uh, but to, for now, I'm going to go because uh, we, tomorrow there is another Earth Live lesson. And I hope that you tune into that one as well in order to learn all about the cool stuff that's going on in the world. Um, but until then, I'll see you online.